Welcome. Will the clerk please call the roll? Hi, Mike. Pete Ambrose? Here. Ed Bateson? Here. Mary McCullough? Here. Keith Varian? Here. Bill Gerber? Here. Tim Lynch? Here. Eric Newman? Here. Cindy Parham? Here. Heather Dean? Present. Alex Durrell? Here. Alexis Harrison? Here. Robin Orris? Here. Julie Gottlieb? Here. Jennifer Hochberg? Here. Phil Pierce? Here. Liz Esma? Here. Josh Garskoff? Here. Ruth Smay? Here. Carol Way? Jay Wolk, Here. Matt Ambrose, Hannah Gale, Ray Newberger, Janice Solomon, Here. Tom McCarthy, Mark McDermott, Jill Vergara, Here. Karen Wackerman, Here. Hank Ferentz, Pamela Iacono, Here. Christine Messina, Here. Peter Tallman, Here. Brian Farnan, Here. Drew Georgiatis, Here. Ken Lee, Here. Bill Perugini, <laughs> Sam Cargill, <laughs> Paul Fadabean, Michael Hurley, Eric Sunman. Representative Hochberg, would you like to come to the mic and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? And before you do so, I believe she has an announcement for everyone. <laughs> Way have you, Representative Ambrose. I am married as of May 21st. <laughs> And I am keeping Hochberg, but my married name is Toller. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations. Thank you very much. First item on our agenda is to consider and act upon the minutes of the budget hearings held on April 5th, 6th, and 7th, 2016, the regular meeting held on April 25th, 2016, and the annual budget meeting held on May 2nd, 2016. Motion to approve, Representative Dean, seconded by Representative Bateson. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, abstentions? No's. Item passes. I said that out of order, sorry. Um, item number three, to receive the assessor's report on tax relief for elderly and disabled homeowners program as required under Chapter 95, Article 3, Section 15.1 of the Town Code of Fairfield. We heard this item in committee. Um, there was no follow-up. Were there any further questions? Excellent. Item number four, to receive a report from the Affordable Housing Committee. We also heard this in committee and there was no follow-up. Okay. Item number five, resolved that the RTM does not reject the change to section 3.9 of the rules and regulations of the Town and Fairfields Employees Retirement System adopted by the Employees Retirement Board on May 25th, 2016, which is as follows. 3.9, pensioners returning to town employment, except as provided below. A pensioner who returns to town employment shall not be entitled to his retirement bene benefits for any month during which he is in such employment. The retirement benefit shall be resumed effective on the first of the month following the termination of such employment. A pensioner may continue to receive his retirement benefits while employed by the town on a part-time or temporary basis in a position other than the position the pensioner held as a full-time employee up to 988 hours in any calendar year. No additional benefit shall be accrued by the pensioner for such periods of employment. If a pensioner continues to be employed by the town after 988 hours of employment in a calendar year, he will not be entitled to his retirement benefits beginning in the first of the month after the 988 hours is completed. Motion to accept, Representative Dean. Seconded by Representative Zezema. Is there any discussion on this item? Representative Farnan. Uh, well, I guess point of order, can I make a motion to amend this uh, ordinance? Is that possible? As far as I know. 
I don't see the town attorney. Uh, uh, can we? Okay. Does anybody, Mr. Mayor? Do, do, do we? Yeah. I'm an attorney. I can do it. Now you get what you pay for. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, shooting a little bit from the hip here, okay. which I don't really like to do. But um, this is an ordinance change proposed by the pension board. So I think any change to the pension plan has to be made by the pension board. I guess what I would say, if there's a sense of the body that they like my proposed amendment, then I think we could probably kick this whole thing down a month if necessary. And uh, Robert Rules of Order speak. So you'd like to have a discussion on a possible amendment for the Employee Retirement Board to consider? Correct. I'll allow it. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read it. So. Uh, Brian Farnan, District 9. Uh, in the current proposed amendment, I would change it and I'll read it as this is the existing language and I'll, and I'll state when it's the new language. A pensioner may continue to receive his retire, it should be his or her, uh, his retirement benefits while employed by the town on a part time or temporary basis um, in a position other than the position. And then I would like to add in something along the lines of or comparable work duties. The, pensioner held as a full-time employee up to 988 hours in any calendar year. Um, the reason for this amendment of adding the words or comparable work duties is to uh, create potential for uh, cronyism. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that could potentially use these type of uh, jobs who, you know, who aren't receiving a pension. You know, I think a little bit of new blood is a good thing. Um, and having the same people within the same department taking on their same or similar roles after leaving um, their time and service to the town, um, I, I think it's good to uh, open those up to potentially new people. Thank you. Okay, Heather, uh, Representative Dean seconding for discussion purposes. Um, and I saw the CFO, did you want to clarify something? Not really, uh, excuse me, not really clarify, just two, two quick comments. One, I'm sure the pension board would have no problem with that. Uh, secondly, there is another degree of uh, control, which is if the town tried to do something like that, the unions would, uh, uh, so for union personnel, that the unions would, would not appreciate that. However, that would not cover department heads, I guess. Those are my only comments. But, but I'm sure the pension board would have actually no problem with it. Mr. Tetro, did you? Uh, through you, Madam Moderator, to uh, Representative Farnan, if you could help. I, I had some comments on that, but I, I wasn't quite sure where you were going. Could you provide a little bit of background in terms of what you're trying to prevent or avoid on that sure. so I could? Ryan Farnan, District 9. Uh, the idea here is to um, open up potential positions to new people who could fill them outside those that are, uh, from our understanding, there is current, this all came about because there was a, a town employee who was looking to take on a different responsibility in, in a different department and had nothing to do with their existing role. Um, so. We are open to that. I, I think you know we want to allow people. We don't want to hamstrung people from not being able to take other types of opportunities within the town. But there is a desire from certain members of my caucus, including myself, that it would be beneficial to not have the same people who held a full-time position for how many X years to retire and then potentially immediately come back in and take on a similar type role within their department. Um, we, I think there are some benefits of having new ideas, new blood, and there's also a concern that, I mean, those positions probably are, I mean, are they being competitively, you know, solicited out for people to, other people within the community to, um, you know, uh, apply for them? We just, I, from our perspective, it seems like there could be, you know, oh yeah, you know, you know, John had this position for 20 years, now he's retiring, but he's kind of, he's not double dipping, but he, well, he is kind of in some ways double dipping because he's working on a part-time basis 
also receiving a pension, why not open up those positions, get new ideas, new insight, um, <clears throat> versus, hey, I know uh, all the people that are, you know, that are potentially looking to hire this person within uh, the department, so I've got the inside track, and, you know, it's going to be kind of, uh, you know, business as usual. This isn't in any way uh, meant to be disparaging on any department or the way the city's run in any way. It's more to do with let's allow new people to come in and take on new roles and responsibilities versus, uh, you know, when people retire, let bring in new people and get new ideas. Okay, that's, it's what you're suggesting, I can't say would never happen. It just structurally, it, it, if we had a full-time position, first of all, all the positions that we have full and part-time are approved in the budget book and consequently also by this body. So if, if we lose a full-time person uh, and we haven't added positions except for, I believe, school security uh, in about the last 10 years. Uh, so the town's running with the same number of heads as, as we did 10 years ago. Not the Board of Ed side, because the school population's gone up and down, but the, the town side. So if somebody leaves from a full-time position, almost in all cases, we're replacing that full-time position with a full-time body, because we have a full-time amount of work to go. In the five years I've been here and watching these, the, the situations where this has come up is when somebody from DPW retired, and they couldn't go work as a special. Or somebody wanted to work, retire and go to work as a part-time bus driver for the senior center. It's that type of thing. It's not. Uh, and and so this I'm, amendment would allow someone to come in in a different role? Yeah. Um, we just. But it's it just the, both the part-time position would have to be approved kind of generally by this body and so would the full-time position. So it, it's not like we can make those up. So if, if those were available, uh, it's, it's, not like you wouldn't hire. If you tried to replace a full-time person with a part-time person, as, as Mr. Mayor mentioned, you'd run into union issues. So that generally there are rules against that type of thing. So that's why I said I'm not quite sure what you're accomplishing. Uh, to the extent that you're, um, you know, tying management's hands a bit in terms of how to, to do this, you can. I'm just not sure why you'd want to in that. And we really haven't had a situation like that, but I can't sit here and guarantee you that that situation wouldn't occur either. So I'm, I'm kind of. What, I guess what I'm not implying that there would be a new pr position created for this individual who has retired. And in some ways, I could see how it could be considered tying the administration's hands. But at the same time, it's still expanding what is currently available. So it's still an expansion. Yeah. I, again, I, it for me, it's been mostly. Uh, in a seldom used type of thing where some folks had wanted to continue as a special. Uh, in case we have now, somebody's leaving um, office staff in the police department, but as part of the THEA union, would like to continue as a special, which she has been doing, but can't because of this. Yep. No, it, so it, it's just, that's the type of situation where we're in. So that's, that's all, just for your consideration. Yep, and we, we had a healthy debate in our caucus about this. Um, I don't see this as in any way as a partisan issue. This is, you know, reasonable people, I think, can differ on this. I think at the end of the day, this is about um, do you want to uh, have more of an opportunity to inject new blood to take on positions when someone retires and, and is receiving a pension? Um, and at the same time, we were providing some level of flexibility and compromise where they could go to a new position. So this was, this was just an attempt to, to kind of uh, meet both those purposes. I have a point of order, Madam Moderator. I, I, I believe that once the debate has started, I don't mean to be disrespectful to the first selectman or your skills as the parliamentarian for the body, but I believe that once an item is on the floor, that each member of the RTM has the opportunity to speak before you go to ex officio members. So I just ask that you keep that in mind going forward. Thank you. I try and recognize people as the hands go up, but thank you. Um, sure. I don't think that's correct unless he's quoting Robert Jules. I was quoting Robert Jules. I believe that's correct. Okay. You wouldn't have a section. I'm not in front of me. I've read it several times, but I can't. All right. I'll, I'll look it up. In the meantime, I do do my best to get to people as the hands go up. In, in my last point, I believe we may have to reject this 
uh, and then bring it back a month from now if that's where the, uh, the body would like to go. But I'll, okay. Representative McCullough. Good evening, Representative McCullough, District 1. There was an allusion to this, um, my question, in some of the dialogue that just happened. Um, I want to be clear that there isn't a position being created so that we can bring a town pensioner back in a department for a position that does not exist. That's my question through you, Madam Moderator, to who can ever answer the question, whether Mr. that's Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Mr. Tetro. Is this motion before us clear that we're not bringing back a pensioner for a position that does not already exist within the town? That would be my understanding. I know Mr. Mayor was working on this with a pension board, and if, if he had uh, if they explored some other thoughts, but in the discussions I was in the pension board and discussion in my again in, I'm going to say all but it may not be hundred percent correct But it's been really about specials and about bus drivers for the senior center where this has come up in discussions I've had and yet there's been workarounds on that in the past have there Oh yeah, it's not. Uh, that's why you're not hearing me up make a passionate plea saying you've got to pass this because it's okay. going to de be detrimental to the town going forward unless you do. Okay. I think there's some operational things that make it. I easier. just wanted to be clear that we're not creating a position so that we can bring back a pensioner because their knowledge was not garnered while they were still an employee, so that they can then help the new employee with their new position. Yeah, not did. Uh, I'd have to refer to Mr. Mayor if there are any other considerations there. The ones I've talked about were the ones I was thinking of. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, can you clarify from committee? I believe this is where all the confusion is lying. Um, on you had made mention of bringing back retirees to do training, and then you'd be able to pay them. I, I think this is the source of the consternation. Yeah, I guess there's, there's three issues here. One, uh, the two pension plans were written equal. Uh, for some reason, a few years ago, because of something going on in the public safety, um, maybe it was somebody wanting to work at the senior center, the then HR director brought to this body the change to allow people to work part-time in another job. But she only brought it to this body for the public safety pension. So that did create an imbalance, an inconsistency, some could say an, uh, an inequality, in the two pension plans. So that's one. Two, as Mr. Tetro has pointed out, the bulk of the, of the uh, purpose of this and the, and the major incentive for this is exactly that issue, which is people wanting to continue working for the town in a different capacity than they currently worked in. But now thirdly, I'm not going to deny that, or de that there could not be a time when it would be intelligent, wise, and smart to bring back somebody to help do something for a short period of time to provide better customer service and to better manage the town. That is a possibility, uh, but that is not the direct answer to the question. That is not the sole purpose or the major purpose of, of this uh, event. But if you have an, a situation where it makes sense, because as I mentioned in my email that in response to Mr. Ambrose's uh, request for information, when you have a significant number of uh, retirements or, 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 or people resigning for whatever reason, and you might need some help in a different capacity, train people, nobody there to train, that might very well be what it could be used for. Yes, it would allow that. Um, and that would be intelligent to allow that from a management perspective, I believe. What do you think, Hurley? <laughs> <laughs> Representative Hurley, and then Representative Garskoff. 
Michael Hurley, RTM District 10. Since I was asked, I'll just uh, offer my opinion. Um, I, I understand what we're trying to do here with the uh, original proposal coming out of the retirement system. I think the um, sense the body motion recommendation from uh, Brian Farnan makes a lot of sense. It's just looking to put a little bit of boundaries around it. Um, I think it's reasonable, and if it is a formal sense of the body, I will support it this evening. Josh Garskoff, District 5. So on the amendment, um, I would like to ask one of the town, uh, maybe Mr. Tetro, um, through you, Madam Moderator, would this change hinder any of the thought, pro like would it, would it prevent you from doing any of these things that you want to do here in terms of the three things we just heard, the three ways this could be beneficial? Yeah, then I guess I could, yeah, I could use some explanation. At my, at my first thought, it would eliminate one of the options that Mr. Mayor said, which was uh, if somebody leaves uh, abruptly and retires abruptly uh, and it takes us a while to find their replacement, then we wouldn't be able to bring somebody back to do some training for them, which has been, you know, which would be a challenge. Now, I can't, if you said when's the last time that happened, I couldn't mention it, so it's not a big driving force in that regard. Um, but since Mr. Mayor seemed to be sure that it doesn't, Bob, perhaps you could clarify for us why it doesn't. But it doesn't for that. I think you need to speak from the mic. The language, if I remember it correctly, says not do your job, basically. It says, or it's kind of, or, or do your, basically what it says is not do your job, the same job, kind of differently defined. It's kind of to clarify, make it clearer. Uh, to me, it's not, it's not an issue. I, my interpretation of that language, as the current HR director for another six days, uh, <laughs> would not prevent me or change my attitude as to what I said earlier as the three purposes of the job, uh, of, of the ordinance. And I don't think it's a bad clarification. And like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, there's no doubt in my mind, though I could be wrong, that the, uh, the retirement board would be quite happy with it. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Tetro? Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Pierce. Phil Pierce, District 4. Um, Madam Moderator, I'd like Mr. Farnan to restate the motion because sure. I, I think that he's right that we, if we don't reject this tonight, it's deemed approved. Correct. So, <clears throat> is, the, is the motion that was on the floor withdrawn? Or? The motion is to reject. Uh, come, come use the microphone, yeah. please. Just, just so we're all clear on what we're voting on. TV happy. Um, the motion is to reject uh, and to get a sense of the body on whether or not uh, the addition of such language uh, as I suggested, which is um, that they cannot take uh, uh, additional employment, uh, uh, they can take a position other than the position um, the petitioner held or comparable work duties would be is what I'm looking to do. So I think we don't have to get the exact wording tonight, but what I would like to do is reject with the belief that we would bring this back at our next meeting with some type of language uh, similar to this, which basically limits um, the individual, the pensioner, from coming back and taking on a similar work duty. And, and if that's good enough for the moderator, it's good enough for me as a motion. Good Lord. All right, so you want to reject it? You're recommending that the body reject it with qualifications? Yes. Okay. Does everybody understand that? <laughs> Representative Gottlieb and then Representative Lee. Julie Gottlieb, District 4. Just to make sure, if we, are, if we reject this tonight and then we're putting it out another month, there's no 
time constraints or issues that would happen by us doing that? Just want to be sure. I'm not sure who can answer that. Mr. Mayor. Uh, the the uh, one issue that we'd not be able to deal with is the current uh, Chief McNamara Secretary who is retiring effective, uh, and there's a party uh, at the uh, Gala Club Wednesday night from four to seven to honor to honor her uh, 30 years of service to the town. So you know, be there um, the at the Gala Club. Um, she would not be able to continue in her current capacity as a special uh, July 1st and thereafter. Correct. Now, so earlier there was a question about workarounds. There was a time uh, when this was ignored, um, and it happened frequently, uh, but we've put an end to that. So we don't, we try to, we're trying to run the town by the rules. And so there were workarounds, you know, X number of years ago, there, there's, there's been no uh, workarounds recently. Thanks. Representative Lee, and then Representative Zezima, and Walk. Representative Lee, District 9. Um, my first thought when I heard this is that it, it might have some unintended consequences of excluding some people while including others. You're going to include some people, but you're also at the some, same time excluding some people. So it really depends upon who you want to include or exclude. And it sounds like that we want to exclude the people who have worked for us already. It doesn't make me feel real good inside, especially if they live in town, they need a part-time job to stay here. My second question, and this is through the moderator to you, Mr. Farnham. Um, so the purpose of your suggestion, I don't know what to call it, whatever it is, um, it, it, Mr. Mayo proposed a hypothetical situation where somebody retires, the position is empty, they bring you back to help someone else get into the job, which provides value to the town, passes on experience. It sounds to me like if we pass this, that would preclude us from doing that. Is that your intention? Brian Farnan, District 9. Um, I guess two things. If, first and foremost, uh, if you're excluded, yes, so there are certain potential people that would potentially be excluded, um, individuals with pensions um, that have worked for the town for a long period of time, but I think the net benefit of opening it up to new individuals um, outweighs that. I also think um, <clears throat> there are a lot of people who don't have pensions that live in town who also would like an opportunity for part-time uh, employment. Um, and then ask for your question regarding training. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you're hopefully running your department in an effective, uh, proper way, um, and someone gives their two weeks notice, um, and you should be able to uh, have a transition to a new individual um, or have a system in place to be able to handle those contingencies. I know in my, you know, my job and probably a lot of everyone else in this room, we're all replaceable, uh, sad, sadly to say. Um, and there should always be, with whatever organization you're involved in, there should be a uh, process in place that if someone were to move on, for whatever reason, hopefully good reasons too, that um, there would be an orderly process to bring someone else into a position or someone else who has that work knowledge. I mean, there should never be a position within, this organ within the city or, or within any organization where only the skill set lies within one person, so that should be able to be handled with. That's my thinking there. Okay. Thank you. I, um, I personally, I'd like to think that we hire people on merit, whether they're town employees, no town employees from Alaska, from Hawaii, from wherever. So I, I, I kind of, this doesn't sit well with me, and I don't really think that I can agree with this. Thank you. On the, uh, so 
On the issue of merit, so we struggled with that too. So then it was like one of the things we discussed in caucus was, well, do we add a, an amendment that says um, that there needs to be a competitive hiring process, and if, and if such another person with similar skill sets steps forward, I'm like, no, it's too much. It's too. It's just, so we were trying to try to limit this because we thought about that issue too, and we didn't feel comfortable, you know, answering that much. At the end of the day. Uh, you know, we want to, you know, bring in new individuals in certain positions or allow, we, you know, we're just trying to avoid kind of, we think this is a, in my opinion, this is a good governance amendment. That's the attempt here. Thank you. Representative Zazima. Liz Esma, District 4. Um, you know, I could go either way on this. I think what we're trying to prevent would be far less likely to happen than excluding somebody with necessary talent to come in even on a temporary basis. Um, Madam Moderator, through you to the first selectman, please confirm for me that we do or we do not endeavor or have to hire a town employee as a part-time, a town resident as a part-time employee. With the exception of police chief and fire chief, I don't think we have residency requirements for any of our positions, except for the elected positions, of course. Okay. Thank you. I, I think I'm leaning in favor of not, how do I say this? Not rejecting, not rejecting because I, I'm just concerned about the exclusionary aspect of it, as opposed to preventing some untoward action. Thanks. I had Representative Walk, but Mr. Mayor, did you just have a clarification or you wanted to opine? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> just let, let the body finish, please. Uh, Representative Walk. <laughs> Jay Walk, District 5. Um, I have a question through you, Madam Moderator, and thank you. Um, to Brian, Representative. Uh, Ferens, um, would this ordinance pertain to the Board of Ed? I don't, I don't, uh, no, it would not apply to the Board of Ed because I don't believe this, this only applies to town employees, not to, this would not apply to police or fire. Busy night for me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we all like you. Thank you. This is a clarification, not a finding. Um, there are Board of Ed employees who are in the town pension plan. Those employees would be impacted by this. I don't have a specific question, but I do have something to add to this discussion. I don't know how many of us know what actually a special does. And if this is, per what I'm hearing, this is, this all started from Chief McNamara's secretary who's retiring who wants to still stay on and become a special. Um, I sent my application in. They did call me about a month ago to, I, I've already, I'm already employed, so I turned it down. But just to let you know, it's not a glorified job. And there's not a lot of people waiting to do this. Um, you don't get paid a salary. There's no medical. But you get paid hourly. And you work on weekends and holidays. There's no, you can't say when you want to work. So my, just my point is that um, I personally, and I'm not against the ordinance, and it's a, it's a good ordinance, and, and I know you're coming from a good place. I'm just saying that, and I'll let you, if you want to come up, um, is that um, I don't find any reason and anything against why she wants to do this. No. Uh, and, and just as a point of clarification, my amendment would not in any way impede that ability okay. for that person to take on that additional position. Okay. I don't want to upset the chief here. I got no <laughs> tickets. <laughs> All right, I'm fine with it. Thanks. Representative Wackerman. Karen Wackerman, District 7. Um, I think my, 
my hesitation about the amendment is that it, it, it strikes me as sort of micromanaging the HR function of the town. And I think um, I trust the town to know when they need people you know, who might have retired for a little while. I think it makes sense to, if they're lucky enough to have someone who can train the next person. That's terrific, I think. So um, I, I think it's unnecessary. I'm also wondering, and maybe Mr. Mayor, through you, Madam Moderator, um, can answer this, if the language with the amendment would be the same or very similar to the police and fire language, or because I know part of the goal here is to try to have it equal. And I'm wondering if this would um, limit it in a way that would make it somewhat unfair to the town employees. First, let me say I agree with your comment about micromanagement. Uh, secondly, the answer would be no. Um, but I interpreted the amendment differently than the amender. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to retract an earlier comment. <laughs> when I said it makes absolutely no difference. And I would also add one other comment on that. And I don't know what the gentleman's work history or experience is. Uh, I have been the CFO, the treasurer, the CEO of multi-billion dollar companies. And we have, have had best practices, good standards, and did I say million? I meant billion. Um, and there's frequently times when you need to call someone back to do something, to manage something. Um, and it's just good management. Um, so, but if the intent of the, so, so basically it would eliminate that opportunity to be able to manage to the fullest benefit of utilizing available resources uh, the way the interpret, the way your interpretation, uh, the way you interpreted your, your amendment, and not the way, the way it read, I don't think it does. Because I don't see training as being comparable, if that makes sense. To me, Training is different than working. So I, I, I saw it as training is, I, I mean, you're working while you're training, but it's different than doing the job. To help someone, to train someone, to educate someone is not doing the job. So to me, that is not a comparable uh, activity. It's meant to be possible. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the way I read it initially. Yeah, that's, you heard it initially. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think um, whether or not it's training or something else, I think I'd like to leave it to the HR person for the town to decide if it's the best thing, so I won't be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Anybody else? Representative Hurley. And then let's move on with this. Um, Michael Hurley, RTM District 10. Um, I, I heard what Chief Fiscal Officer Mayer said. And in terms of private and public sector, I think they're much different. In private sector, this practice does happen quite often. But in, in the public sector, you need to be careful of, of, of cronyism, favoritism. And that's why in the public sector, you have public bidding on contracts. So I think to make the analogy, just because this is in the private sector, that it should happen in the public sector, r really is flawed. Um, I still think that the Farnan uh, proposal is terrific, and I plan on supporting it. Representative Dean. Representative Dean, District 3. Um, you know, I had talked about this ordinance or this proposal during committee, and I was a little surprised by it because originally I thought, just from my own personal perspective of observing my parents who never wanted to retire, and I am going to get to the point of this, um, who never wanted to retire, really struggled with it, and then when they finally did, were really happy, really, really happy, but it took a long time. Anyway, so I kept thinking, gosh, it's time to move on. And, but I thought about some more, and I did talk with Bob Mayer about this, and he gave the reasons, the rationale, as he did this evening. 
But to this amendment and the idea of um, best practices, I think that that's key. And bringing the private sector sometimes, that perspective is important because we are all private citizens here. I believe we're all private. There's a few that are town employees. But we all are private citizens and we do bring our personal and private um, experience here. And there are such positions as interim. And I believe we've had interim positions in place in the past and we've used that and used it successfully until we found the permanent person. So I too am going to support um, our HR and our town um, and I won't be supporting this in particular. Thank you. Anyone else before I try and figure out what we're voting on? <laughs> I, I think the simplest thing is just a motion to reject and then it will find itself back to us if it is rejected. Representative Pierce. Phil Pierce, District Forum. I think we should just vote on the motion as it is on the agenda. And then if it, that prevails, I think, you know, uh, Representative Farner has expressed his view, which others have supported, and the board can take that up or not and send it back to us. That's my, that's my suggestion. Well, you think you would need to withdraw your, you had a formal motion on to amend. I would agree with that. I will withdraw my motion. Okay. And you've stated your case for why you think the pension board should reconsider some additional language. And I hope to see it come back to <laughs> if it's rejected, you hope that it comes back in another form. Correct. Okay. Does the clerk all have all that for the record? Is that a fair assessment? Okay. Representative McCullough. Yes. Okay. So the motion in front of you is that the RTM does not reject the change to section 3.9. So if you're comfortable with the language that's in front of you, vote yes. If you prefer to see something different, then vote no. Okay. Does everybody understand? All right. Is there any comment from the public on this item? Representative, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Dwyer. Hello, Phil Dwyer, uh, Chairman of the Board of Education. Uh, correct, it only covers the roughly 400 staff who are non-certified. Uh, but the concern I would have is uh, the HR director will get th this change of motion and say, well, what do they really mean by comparable position? Because that's a term of art. And second, uh, when you are trying to hire to fill positions to, uh, uh, to have uh, restrictions on management's ability to figure it out, um, I can't tell you what the impact might be uh, on our 400 positions because there are so many different circumstances. So as the chair of the Board of Education, I'd just be a little bit nervous because we do have to get those positions filled to serve students. So if you're going to reject it and send it back, uh, please try to give more guidance to the pension board as to what you're really trying to accomplish. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right, excellent. Can we do a voice vote? No, we're going to do a roll call vote because that'll make my life easier. Sorry. Will the clerk please call a roll? Peter Ambrose. Yes. Ed Bateson. Yes. Mary McCulloch. No. Keith Varian. Bill Gerber. Yes. Eric Newman. Yes. Cindy Parham. Yes. Heather Dean. Yes. Alexis Harrison. Yes. Robin Orris. No. Julie Gottlieb. No. Jen Hochberg. Yes. Phil Pierce. Yes. Liz Esma. Yes. Josh Garskoff. Yes. Ruth Smay. Yes. Carol Way. No. Jay Walk. Yes. Ray Newberger. Janice Solomon. Yes. Jill Vergara. Yes. Karen Walkerman. Yes. Pamela Iacono. Yes. Christine Messina. Yes. Peter Tallman. Yes. Brian Farnan. No. Nope. Drew Georgiadis. Yes. Ken Lee. Yes. Paul Fadabin. No. Michael Hurley. No. Eric Sunman.
23 yes, 8 no. So the resolution has been accepted. Item number 6. To hear, consider, and act upon the following appointment to the Holland Hill School Building Committee as recommended by the Board of Selectmen, William R. Manderville, Republican, 82 Woodcrest Road. Um, may have a motion to approve. Representative Dean, seconded by Representative Parham. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, any comments from the public? Back to the body. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item passes. Item number seven. To hear, consider, and act upon the following appointment to the Solid Waste and Recycling Commission as recommended by the Board of Selectmen, Joseph R. Pagnozzi, Republican, 1496 Fairfield Woods Road, term 1115 to 1119, to fill a vacancy for William Schaff, whose term expired. Motion to approve. Moved by Representative Dean, seconded by Representative Bateson. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, any comments from the public? Back to the body. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item passes unanimously. Item number eight. To hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen, resolved that the application received under the Neighborhood Assistance Act program are hereby approved and that the Director of Community and Economic Development is hereby designated as the Municipal Liaison of the Town of Fairfield for this program. Moved by Representative McCullough, seconded by Representative Georgitis. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, any comments from the public? Back to the body. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item passes unanimously. Item number nine, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen, resolved that the program year 42, October 1st, 2016 to September 30th, 2017, Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, is hereby approved in the amount of $480,500, which includes entitlement grant funds of 46893 and a program income of $12,407, and further resolved that Michael C. T. Tetro, first selectman of the town of Fairfield, be and hereby is authorized to execute any and all of the necessary documents that facilitate the town's partition, participation in said CDBG program. Moved by Representative McCullough, seconded by Representative Zezema. Any discussion on this item? Comments from the public? Back to the body. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item carries unanimously. Item number 10. To hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Finance. Resolved that the bond resolution entitled a resolution amending and restating a resolution adopted by the representative town meeting on June 24, 2013 entitled a resolution appropriating $11,630,000 for the costs associated associated with the expansion of the renovation of Fairfield Ludlow High School and authorizing the issue of bonds to finance such appropriation to increase the amount of the appropriation and the bond authorization by $3,907,674 be and hereby is approved, moved by Representative Vergara, seconded by Representative Bateson. Is there discussion on this item? Representative McCullough and then Representative Tallman Bateson. Good evening, Representative McCullough, District 1. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank um, the moderator and pointing us to the volumes of information that go back years on this project. And I'm not here to ask a question, I'm just here to make a statement that within all those volumes, there unfortunately was a breakdown. And there appeared to be flags that were raised, but just missed. And here we are, as we were the night we voted for the appropriation, we got to do this now. And I, I feel bad for the taxpayers that in all the years this building committee has been in action that elected officials, including this body, have missed the warning signs. Thank you. Representative 
Good evening, Peter Tallman, RTM District 8. Uh, I'm new here to the RTM, and part of the reason I ran for the RTM was because I saw a lot of things that went on in town, a lot of money being spent, and in some cases not a lot to show for it. And I'm kind of stuck with a $4 million bill here that it's tough to explain to the taxpayers. Um, the building committees give it their best shot, but they're volunteers, they're amateurs with no experience. We've started to address the experience factor, I believe, by hiring a, a construction guy for the Holland Hill project, which is good because the portables there, I think, are already double the budget. We haven't even started it yet. A few weeks before we start Penfield, we find out it's 12 inches too short. We have to go back for more money, which we didn't get, so we scrapped it. Um, Ludlow, the few things I think that can help and I'm sure there's some people here that can add their two cents and, and comment on mine if they want to. But first it was based, the Ludlow job was based on budgetary numbers, which was a big mistake. You can't base anything on that. And I know there were time constraints, but that's not an excuse. Um, and they were way off. They were way off. Um, we also, I think, need somebody to check on the, the balances and the, the checkpoints for the timeliness of it and for the, the budget money. And somebody can say, wait a second, we are going way off course, which we were. And as Mary said, the flags were up, but they seem to be ignored. Um, there seemed to be confusion between what was offered for the cafeteria, what was built. I'm not sure where that fell through the cracks, but according to the Board of Finance, and they'll be help, helping with the checks and balances, what was delivered was not what they agreed on. How that fell through, where that fell through, I don't know. And finally, just back to the construction expertise, I think it's, it's difficult for a building committee without a builder on the committee to bounce things off of. There could be things where a builder sitting in the room can say, hold it, time out, we're going way off course, this is going to cost a lot more money. Maybe not, but I think we're, we're missing the boat by not having experience on these boards. And I don't know if it's the Board of Ed or the Board of Selectmen or the Board of Finance, but we have to figure this out. It's way too much money. It's way too much money. It's going to be twice what the governor's taken away from us for the education fund which the whole town was up in arms about, and it seems like everybody around is like, well, we're four million short on the windows. We have a lot of smart people in this room, in this town, that we can use to help this, and I think we have to do that starting tonight. Thanks. Um, I think Mr. Tetra just wanted to make a clarification on the Holland Hill portables. Uh, just so everybody's clear that the um, there was discussion at some point of that number going to 500,000 uh, based on the most recent update it's back to 250,000 that they're going ahead on that so the uh, that portion of Holland Hill is back on budget I think it might be 50,000 over but um, representative Bateson Thank you, Madam Moderator. Ed Bateson, District 1. This one, I found this one a little frustrating. Haven't been on the body for several years. I, 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 I didn't know what to say. I, you know, did the wheels come off? Who's to say? I think the Board of Finance did a great job in assessing and asking for timelines and reviewing everything, all the minutes and so forth. I got to tell you, one of, the, one of the things I saw happen with this building committee that I found frustrating was that decisions were made that I didn't necessarily agree with or I didn't think were in the spirit of what we were expecting. And when these problems started to arise or it became evident that we were going to go over budget, I, what I saw was that information or that the, the problem was stuck at the top level and didn't disseminate down far enough. And, and what happens in a situation like that is the building committee was left with, we need to go forward and do what we can. And what they did was 
they made decisions on our behalf that maybe we wouldn't have agreed with. I mean, if you were given a set amount of money to do a certain amount of things and that wasn't achievable, you really should have come back because now with those big, big numbers that are out there, you're now eliminating portions of the project that might have been important to a lot of people in this room, including myself, which, which, I, which I found bothersome. If you look at the Penfield Committee, you know, given all the problems they faced, I, I give them credit in the fact that when they realized that they were going to hit a wall with their numbers, they came back. And we have to realize in this room that anything we do has a cost, to so, most of the things we do have a cost associated to it, and that determines whether we, in, in my case, whether I support it or not. And, you know, Penfield, when numbers went up, it changed my opinion. Maybe if something came back with Ludlow, did we want to spend an extra million dollars on the cafeteria? At the time when I was sitting in that classroom at Riverfield when we approved this project, the cafeteria wasn't number one on my list. That was number three on my list. Number one on my list was the windows because that had been kicked around for over a decade. Number two on my list was classrooms because that's what's most very important in this district. The cafeteria was number three. So by default, the building committee made a decision to proceed with that, spent money on, an, on something that I didn't necessarily agree with, and that's where I think the process failed. I think that the building committees and the first selectmen and the board of selectmen, once something comes up, no matter it, 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 if it's going to change the scope of what we expect, it needs to come back. It just does. I'm sorry if that holds up the pro pro project, but it just does. That's what good government's all about, and that's why I object to this. But given what we left behind, I have to support this tonight. And that's where I am. I'm going to support it, but with objections. Thank you. Representative Lee and then Representative Dean. <laughs> Representative Lee, District 9. Uh, Representative Tallman kind of rang my bell because I got involved with this when we were trying to renovate Sherman. And Sherman is kind of a unique situation because of its location. Um, <laughs> to, we were constricted, of course, by FEMA. And um, that was a very, very difficult project. I went to every single meeting, and I can tell you that my blood pressure has still not recovered from that, from that experience. And, you know, we got a whopping $2 million uh, for that school, and if, for those of us who was in that meeting on Thursday night about the pile, it was about 104 in that gymnasium because there's no money for air conditioning. One thing that, I, that I've noticed from watching these things is that when you spec out a job, it's kind of like buying a car. In my case, it might be a computer. So I look on the website, and the website says 995. And I say, yeah, it's a good price for that laptop. I think I'll look into it. And then I find out that when I get all of the pieces on that laptop that makes it what I actually want and need, it's not 995 anymore. It's more like 1695. That's the first thing. The second thing is, at some point in time, an estimate appears. This is what we think it's going to cost. I'm sorry, that means very little because it's two years before we build it. So whatever the estimate was, you have to add two years to that. So the second thing is, it's just an estimate. The only number that matters is what somebody says they will do the job for. That's the only number that means anything. And until we have those numbers, we really don't know what we're doing. And I. I I have the same frustrations. I don't like explaining to my neighbors about Penfield. I don't like explaining about any of these things. But I, I and I do, would like to see, obviously, more professional expertise. But it's something that we have to understand that these people are doing the best they can, and they don't always, they don't always intuitively know what we want to do. But uh, in any event, I think that, you know, it's clear that we have to finish this and revisit the process once again, hopefully. As Mr. Bateson said, we'll get it a little better next time.
Representative Dean, District 3, uh, this has been a long process for sure, and uh, having served on this body since 2003, I've seen quite a few building projects gone through, and um, countless volunteers who have served on building committees who really deserve gold medals, every single one of them, for, um, for going through this. Uh, I'm disappointed, and I did express that. I, I don't know where things went south, if they will, but we do have a situation in front of us that we have to vote on. Um, but through you, Madam Moderator, to our first selectman, uh, what is the plan in place so that we can um, remedy and we can make sure that this doesn't happen in the future so that we have full control over our buildings, renovations? One, I think, in part, what you're asking for is a miracle, because I don't think the construction industry has fit, f figured that out, and I will defer to Mr. Tallman, who certainly has a family background in, in considering this. However, I think there are a number of lessons learned in terms of what we went through here. Uh, one is we keep comparing back to a concept, and this was a new approach on school building projects than we've had in the past. Uh, we, the Board of Ed spent additional money to try and get a better concept or better estimate so it would be more refined. Um, we also had a project where we took really three separate projects and combined them into one. We talk about three phases, but it really wasn't like first story, second story, third story in terms of phases. These were three independent projects. We did it at the same time and assigned them to the same building committee. They were, for the most part, independent. And lastly, we had a September 1st deadline that while it wasn't necessary for two of the phases, for the middle phase, the construction and classroom expansion, September 1st, 2015 was a driving force for the entire project in terms of getting it done. When you look at some of the things we learned, One, as this project uh, went on, we had four reviews in front of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, we also had a review where I got the building committee leadership team together. The chair, the construction manager, the owner's rep, Mr. Marbido, Mr. Mayor, and also asked Jim Bradley, who's chair of the Penfield Building Committee and was one of the uh, people that was around when we started the Town Facilities Commission uh, and has some great background in this. And Steve Pentanello, who's a member of the Town Facilities Commission currently and also sits on the uh, Penfield Building Committee. And we met uh, on two different afternoons to kind of review what had taken place and see what we can learn. The biggest one was that the concept e estimates, the, the better detail, if you will, didn't help. It wasn't just a project. We had three different types of projects rolled into this. One was a roof project. Concept estimate was nowhere near what it cost. The only thing that let us get the roof part anywhere near the estimate was the fact that the building committee went back for an edge spec change to do a single layer roof rather than a double layer. And the second layer uh, was in essence replaced by a grant we got from UI where we put solar panels on it. So it's a two-layer roof, different technology, different approach. We used outside funding, if you will, for the second layer. Otherwise, that concept estimate wouldn't be done, and roof estimates are about as easy as we get. The windows estimate was way off, in part because of the time it took to go to EPA and get a mitigation plan. And as we found out with PCBs, the EPA can take time, and a mitigation plan is something that uh, has increased cost uh, significantly on this project. And then on a construction piece, which was both the classrooms and the cafeteria, that was also significantly off. So the additional work we did on the concept didn't help in the three types of projects that we kind of do, construction, roofs, and windows. <coughs> second, there was some discussion back and forth about first architect versus second architect and dueling architects. And I don't think that helped. The, um, 
building committee came in, the, the concept plan had a lot of work going on in a courtyard. In fact, a part of the project being built in the courtyard. Second architect comes in and says, you can't logistically do that. You can't build a project inside that interior courtyard. Uh, and second, the users, uh, in this case the school administration, didn't want to give up the courtyard as part of the project. Um, I think going forward, what we've been talking about and what I'm going to propose to the Board of Selectmen uh, is that we take a look where the town, in fact, will hire the owner's rep, the architect, and the construction manager. We have a little bit more flexibility on town projects. One of the places we get into some issues is on the school projects where there's certain restrictions, but it appears that the restriction is that they have to go out to bid, not that they have to be hired by the building committee. I think to some degree it's unfair to the building committee who, has, as always pointed out, are volunteers. And the first thing we do is ask them to come in and make critical decisions on architects, on owner's reps, and on the construction manager. And I, I am going to propose to the Board of Selectmen to look at the town taking that over using some of our expertise. And as much as it may be hard to get building trades people on building committees, so for anybody who sat around here, and I will go back to, um, I think Riverfield was the case in point, where filling out building committees is not always the easiest thing to do. And I think it was this body that asked that they have a representative on the building committee. Then there was a bit of a challenge in that we couldn't get anybody to actually step up and do that. Now, I'm not knocking the, the body at all because that makes sense to me. You guys are busy enough. Throwing in more meetings on top of that each month is not what everybody can do. So getting somebody to sit on a building committee is hard enough if it's just that building committee and these building committees typically go on for two to three years. However, if we can take advantage of the construction expertise we have, the building expertise, as Mr. Tallman said, and use that expertise to help hire the architect, the owner's rep, and part of the, the carrot, if you will, is that you'll get to work across multiple projects. It won't increase the budget because we'll use the, the, we're already paying for an owner's rep, an architect, and construction manager in the building budgets. We'll just use that money to do that, kind of assign them per project as it comes up. So that's what we're going to explore on that side. I think the idea of combining three projects like this in one, one of the lessons learned is we never want to do that again. It should be a, a one project is one project. This should actually have been run as three different projects. And if I had to change it, I'd change it a little bit differently. I would have done the one with a deadline first. Since the classrooms had a deadline of September 1st, that should have been the project that was done first. Once you get into this and they're doing all three at one time, the roof was actually the one that got done first or furthest along. But because you had three different bid documents, you could never tell where the whole project was until it got way too late in the process. And I think that's something we definitely want to avoid in the future. So I think while those things don't guarantee we won't find PCBs in the gym as we did at Riverfield, those things don't guarantee we won't find PCBs to the extent we did at Osborne Hill. I think they very much cut down on the, the probability that's happening. But the key is for us to realize that the concept estimates um, have a long way to go and we need more detailed documents before we can get there. So the goal will be to get to those detailed documents with professionals and we basically give our volunteers on the bill billing committee better resources than we have in the past to help with that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Representative Hurley, then Representative Gerber. Um, Michael Hurley, RTM, District 10. Um, begrudgingly, uh, I am going to support the expenditure on the windows. Um, but, but I do want to talk a, a little bit about a, a comment that was made earlier by one of my uh, colleagues from, from District 8. And just, just to clarify things, as at least I see it, when you're going out and, and trying to make an analogy to the building committee process, and you use an example of going to purchase your own, uh, a, a new computer for oneself, and you're, you're in Best Buy, and you, you see the advertisement for $995, and then you get there and you realize, hey, you know, the advertisement was great, but 
after I started talking to the salesman, you know, I, I really wanted this bell and whistle, that one, I wanted a webcam, I wanted, you know, the latest Intel processor. I, I think that's fine when you're using your own money. But what we're talking about here is taxpayer money. And we have a process in town that needs to be followed. We have building committees. And as Representative Bateson noted before, the Penfield Pavilion, you know, th that, that committee really went, I think, above and beyond. And there were times when I was very frustrated with it. But they did come back to us. So I, I, I think it's, I, I don't think it's a good idea to try and make an analogy like that because it clouds the decision-making process of this body. And building committees, when they're changing the scope of a project, they're using taxpayer money. So when, when it's significant material, they need to come back to this body. Thank you. a few notes here. Sorry. Um, Bill Gerber, District 2. Uh, one of the advantages or disadvantages I have is to have a wife on the Board of Ed. And Jessica just talks about this stuff 24-7. So I've been tracking uh, these building committees for years. And I have to say I'm a little bit surprised by the surprise at this particular process because to me, it's not all that dissimilar to every building process, most, not all, but most of the building processes I've seen over the last 10 years. And I just want to, you know, for, for yucks, I went back and just started Googling the Riverfield project. And, uh, the, you know, the process was different. And, um, but in November 2011, Riverfield was supposed to cost $9 million based on a, um, schematic plan done by uh, someone that we hired that was in the long-term facilities plan. Um, there's a great quote in the uh, Citizen News from uh, Jim Walsh, who's on the Board of Finance, who said, okay, you know, to the $9 million. What I don't want to find out further down the road is that it's a $20 million project. So what happened was it ended up being a $16.3 million project. Um, Two million of that was PCBs, they had no way of knowing, but, you know, 14.3, going from 9 million to 14.3 um, was, was a big leap. Um, and there were, there were big reasons for that. Um, um, and I understand it was a, a very different process. That was a real preliminary estimate. We expected better in this process because we paid somewhat more for a more fleshed out plan. But, you know, if you look at the Woods project, you know, just as bad. We, we started out with an estimate of, I think, nine to 10 million. That cost 24 million uh, eventually. So um, we should be used to the fact that these things, there's, there's an issue with, with the process. The, this patch that was done to try to speed up the process this time was to get a more fleshed out plan and then go and then build that out a little bit more. Slightly different process, but the end result, I'm used to seeing in this town. I've been seeing it for, for 10 years and I'm really surprised at how people are surprised by this and saying that somehow this is different than the issues that we've seen in the past. because. If you've been following this, it's really not. That now, there's room for improvements. And I think what Mr. Tetro, what, what frustrates me the most was, especially in the committee meetings, the finger pointing about failures of this, a failure of that. I, 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 I agree there are failures, but it's a failure in, in the process. And I think the things that Mr. Tetro has presented will go a long, may go a long way. I think people need to work together. This is, and I agree with, with uh, Representative Tallman, you know, it is unacceptable in the end to not have a better grip on the plan. But we have a process in place which sort of airlifts people in who may not have been in at, ever on a building committee before, may not have been involved. They do the best they possibly can. And sometimes they don't have, you know, the five years of background that 
going through all the various committees, they, they're told that the Board of Finance wants this or that, but it doesn't really, they don't really understand it because they haven't sat through hundreds of hours of meetings. And I think what Mr. Tetro is, is suggesting may be a solution to have a more sort of professional aspect of these building committees to add some consistency and a higher degree of confidence that the people will have all the necessary background and will be the right people. But this isn't that much different. I think, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, um, Mr. Tetro, there was a great quote in uh, the Citizen News where when we came back with the, 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 the going from a nine million plan to a, um, to a $15 million budget, he said, I've got sticker shock. Like, he, he didn't really know it e why either. And Mr. Mr. Quinn, who was the head of that Fairf uh, Riverfield Building Committee, said, look, I, we built out a bare bones, you know, we built out the plan based on the ed specs. This is what it's going to cost, you know, excluding the PCBs. Um, this is what you want, this is what's going to cost. Now, there's been some argument about, you know, maybe the, way the cafeteria was constructed is, you know, could have been cheaper, uglier, more simple, whatever. That, that really, in the end, I, I don't understand sort of putting that necessarily on, on, the, on, on the building committee because what the building committee got as a quote for that was in line slightly over, maybe 150000 over the, the budget. So they thought that they were approving something that was going to be in line with the budget. <laughs> Um, it came in over. So maybe somebody, like uh, if one of, you know, if Mr. Tetro hired the, the project manager, maybe that person would be qualified to say, no, let's, let's step back, guys, you know, as, as an owner's rep or as a project manager. And that, that's what we need to just fix this process. But I don't see finger pointing. I don't, I don't get it. I don't, also don't get the comparisons with, Hey, somehow it was better in the old days because I know Ms. Iacono lived through this. You know, it really wasn't. It was, a, it was a different process. But from beginning to end, the differences were huge in the past. So, you know, let's just move on. Let's work together. Let's support some positive changes. Thank you. Representative Ambrose and then Representative Farnan. Peter Ambrose, District 2. There's an air of uh, what appears to be a general acceptance of, uh, of, of these overruns. And that bothers me. It's, it's almost like, well, that's, that's what happens. That's, it's it's part, of the, uh, part of the way it should happen. I respectfully disagree with uh, Representative Gerber. I uh, think the process is flawed. Four million bucks is four million bucks. It's a lot of money. Perhaps one of the things we did wrong when we uh, appropriated the money is maybe we should have broken the money down into the three categories and assigned a certain amount of money to each of the three categories, the roof, the building project, and the PCBs, and allocated a certain amount for each of the three categories. But an overrun of $4 million is, just shows, I think, a tremendous lack of, of oversight. I respectfully acknowledge what the first selectman has said, and I, uh, I trust you can lead us going forward in trying to write in this, this path, because it's not fair to the taxpayers. Thank you. Ryan Farnan, District 9, and I'll be quick because we all know this is going to pass. Let's get everyone home. Um, I'm a supporter of education. I understand we need proper infrastructure in place for our, our, for our students. Um, cost overruns like this make it really hard to, in the future, for this body to support, you know, projects like this. I think the, the moral of the story is we need to have longer memories uh, next time a multi-phase larger capital expenditure project comes up. I think that is the key area we need to be very, very careful. Let's not, uh, let's, let's break these things down so we can have proper oversight. Let's not micromanage, but we, I, I, 
I agree with the first selectman in, 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 one, in one particular aspect that you talked about. We really need to not have these type of multi-phase projects moving forward. Um, we all have to support this. You know, besides putting money in the classrooms, probably second issue is health and safety. Um, my only ta ask is that the town really is a little bit more reflective here. Um, let's look at the root cause analysis of how we got here. I'm not blaming the first selectman, the BRE, or anyone else. Um, I'm just asking that, you know, we be reflective on the process and before the next project moves forward, we kind of could look at what happened here and, and learn from it. Thank you. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken who wishes to speak to the item? Representative Gerber. I, I, I just want to make one point, not, not in response to, well, maybe in, in, in response to using the, uh, the term cost overrun. Um, the, the, the cost, cost overrun for many, many of the projects isn't necessarily an applicable term. I think it, it, it probably is in, in the Ludlow project for a number of reasons. But we've had overruns, but not because the, the initial budgets were terrible. You know, they, they, were, they were rough. And as part of the process, you know, Mr. 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 Tetro is going to have to look at, and, and I think he, he, he said, you know, he would like to play a bigger role in hiring the project manager and the architect to make sure that the budgets are accurate. We had in Riverfield and in Woods initial estimates that didn't come anywhere close to where a, a, a good budget would have come. And then once they were fleshed out, it's my understanding, Mr. Tetro, that once Woods was fleshed out and you went for approval. Once Riverfield was fleshed out in a formal plan and you went for approval, Riverfield, the only overage was due to PCBs, which you hadn't foreseen, but the project came in on budget. It was just a heck of a lot more than the rough draft. So as part of this process, we're going to have to figure out how to efficiently come up with a good plan very quickly because looking at the, look, the history of the Riverfield project, it took I believe, unless I'm wrong, um, Ms. Iacona, you, you were close to this. I believe it took seven months just to get funded for the $250,000 just to form the committee and start doing the work. I mean, these things, you know, we're very bureaucratic in New England, you know, the way we run our business. And we need to be able to do this more efficiently. And if we could do that with a full plan, the way Mr. Tetro is proposing, in, you know, efficiently, then this will work a lot better. I want to get back on topic. The topic is the Ludlow Window Project. If you have something to add to whether or not we should approve the Ludlow Windows, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Seeing no one. I didn't say you can't speak. Do you have anything else to wish to add on the windows? Because that's the motion, is approving the windows. I think we've beat process to death now. Is there anybody from the public who wishes to speak? Back to the body. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Representative Harrison, abstentions? Representative McCullough, the item passes. Item number 11, to consider and act upon any other matters presented to the said meeting which may be properly acted upon under the rules of the representative town meeting. Does anybody have any other business? Seeing none, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Representative Dean, seconded by Representative Wackerman. We stand adjourned.